All right. Okay, well, I'm really glad to introduce our speakers today. Um, today we have Lisa Shenson and Tariq Ahmad presenting for us. So I'm going to tell you a little bit about them and then I'm going to pass it on over to them. So first about Lisa, Lisa is a type 1 diabetes parent and advocate. Her now adult daughter, Kara, was diagnosed in first grade and has now been living with T1D for 22 years. Upon diagnosis and for a few years after, she and her family attended Bearska Meadow Camp with DYF. With Dr. Mary's dosing instructions in hand, she vividly remembers crying as her daughter sipped her first milkshake at Hume Lake. Lisa has been deeply and passionately involved in disability rights advocacy as well as legislative initiative for the past 20 years. Through collaborations with outstanding national and community partners, including DYF, ADA, JDRF, DREDF, UCSF, and local area and online support groups, Lisa says it's been tremendously gratifying work to support diabetes families to build positive enduring partnerships with schools. She provides education about legal rights through the lens of federal and state laws, the process to establish 504 plans and diabetes medical management plans, and due process resolution process for conflicts and grievances, all connecting the dots between that information and the individual needs of each family. Lisa's fierce devotion to advocacy is driven by our shared desire to ensure that every child with diabetes is safe and appropriately supported in school. And she and her husband live in Marin County, California. We also have Tariq Ahmad with us. He is an amazing member of our medical professional board, um, as well as volunteering with us at Camp de los Niños most summers, not this one, but most summers. Um, and so Tariq was born and raised in Portland, Oregon, and he trained on the East Coast doing his undergraduate studies at Cornell University and medical school at New York Medical College, as well as his pediatric residency at the Children's Hospital of Cleveland Clinic. He spent several summers at different diabetes camps, volunteering his time, and even doing his pediatric endocrinology fellowship at Children's Hospital Los Angeles and working at Camp Conrad Chinook in Southern California. Since 2006, Dr. Ahmad has been on staff at UCSF Benioff Children's Hospital Oakland as a clinical associate professor of pediatrics in the Division of Endocrinology. And ever sum every summer since then, he's been part of the medical team at Camp De Los Niños with DYF in the beautiful Santa Cruz Mountains. He's also been part of the medical staff at DASH Camp and has given diabetes camps at national conferences and for organizations like JDRF and CarbDM. On his time off, he enjoys playing soccer and tennis and traveling with his wife and two sons. So with that, you're in great hands. So I'm going to pass it on over to Lisa, who's going to start us off tonight. Thank you. I want to say that I'm just so appreciative of this opportunity to be able to talk with all of you tonight. It's the silver lining in the pandemic dark cloud to, as I just said to Kayla, to kind of normalize the experience of connecting with each other through this virtual means. So I appreciate being able to be with all of you and um, we have a lot of information to cover tonight. Before I jump into all of that, I do want to also just talk with all of you for a minute about a very piece, important piece of legislation here in California. It's called AB 2203, and it is a bill that would cap insulin pricing for state regulated plans. This bill right now is being contemplated for a hearing in the Senate, and they need to hear our voices on why this bill matters. It is so crucial to be able to have affordable insulin. And I'm gonna share my contact information with you in just a minute. And I'd be delighted to hear from you. Um, right now, the most important thing is to share your stories with Senator Tony Atkins, who is President Pro Tem of the Senate, her phone number is 916-651-4039. And Senator Richard Pan, who is a physician and chair of the Senate Health Committee. His number is 916-651-4006. Diabetes community, let's get our voices heard and let's make insulin affordable in California. And with that, let me 
start sharing my screen. Uh oh. One sec here. That's okay. I, Lisa, while you figure that out, I'm going to put those phone numbers into the chat box for everybody. Thank you very much. Welcome. So now what happened? I am so sorry, one sec. I feel like everybody's parents where I can't figure out what's going on here. Okay. So go to Zoom. Share. And okay, do you see the screen? Terrific. Okay. So this is my contact information and I welcome everybody to stay in touch, please. Uh, feel free to send me an email at any time, lshenson at hotmail.com. Look forward to getting your emails. Today we're gonna talk about taking diabetes to school and most notably during COVID. The world is like on a big global 504 plan with hot spots all over the place. And so in some ways, I think now more than ever, even people who don't live with diabetes understand a little bit about some of the things that we've been thinking about for a long time about going to school with diabetes. So let's talk about what is school advocacy? What are stakeholders' roles? What are the legal protections afforded children with type one and the relevant policies? How do you use law and policy for your child? And what resources are available to support you? Type one diabetes school advocacy means creating access to a medically safe environment and achieving your students' medical and academic goals having equal access to educational opportunities and activities like field trips and extracurriculars and sports, having a seamless transition from home life to school life, forging a partnership with your school, providing education and support to your school, documenting agreements and grievances, and having accountability. There are basically three stakeholders, all of which are around a child-centric process. And that child-centric process is, do we hear Emma's voice? Do we hear Jason's voice? The medical team, the school personnel, and the parents all work together as advocates for the child. And I just love this device. I think that when you're in a 504 meeting and there's ever uh, tension about an issue is to is say this exact question. Do we hear your child's name's voice? It's important that you know what the best practices are. And these essentially have been laid out 
by the friends at the American Diabetes Association through their position statement, which most endocrinology practices follow. And that is to integrate diabetes care into the school day, to have in-class blood glucose monitoring and care so that it minimizes disruption in learning, to have self-care anytime, anywhere, to have immediate access to supplies, to have two to three adults trained in all aspects of diabetes care and that at least one of those people is on site at all times, to have training before school starts so that your child is safe from minute one, to have written plans, a 504 plan or if appropriate, an IEP, we'll talk about that in a minute, a diabetes medical management plan and or an individualized health plan, to have a backup plan if the trained people are not able to be on site, to have an emergency plan if there's a lockdown situation or an earthquake, and to have full participation in all activity. According to the American Diabetes Association's position statement on the care of children with diabetes in school, it's recommended that there be three levels of training. And this chart pretty much lays out who does what. There's a large group of people who are teachers, yard duty, bus drivers, the front office, the health aide. Everybody gets to know what is diabetes? What are the signs and symptoms of a high and a low? And what treatment is needed? It doesn't mean they're gonna deliver the treatment, but at least they understand what's involved. And how do food and activity and illness impact your blood glucose levels? And how might that manifest itself in your child? And then who to contact on site for immediate treatment. Then there's a smaller group of designated personnel, and that might be a couple of teachers who uh, work with your child, uh, a health aide, um, a smaller group of people. And those folks get the basic training, plus they also learn about how to treat a low and how to administer glucagon. And then a much smaller group of two to three designated people who are either within that smaller group or in addition, who get all that we've just talked about, plus all the other care needs, carb counting, ketone checks, insulin administration by preferred method, use of the pump, CGMs, meters, PDMs, the whole shebang. And by employing this tiered level, you're creating a very wide safety net of support for your child. And that way your child always has immediate access to someone who is able to provide care. So this is my favorite. I love Lady, Liber Lady Justice. Um, law and policy are what inform this process. And at the base of it all, the foundation is the national, the federal law and, po and national policy. And then states are on top of that and they are basically drawing from that information and then it gets up to the local level or I like trickle up, but they say trickle down, um, where it gets to uh, your county and your local school district. So let's talk about the federal laws. In order to have a context to understand this, there is a legal definition of the term disability. And so a disability is a physical or mental condition that impairs a person's ability to perform a major life activity. And examples of that might be 
eating, walking, talking, thinking, learning, providing self-care. Um, in fact, within the uh, legal language, it references impairment of the endocrine system. And uh, diabetes also can fall under another term called other health impairment. And what we know about diabetes is that out of range blood glucose levels have the ability to impair a person's ability to perform a major life activity. If someone is experiencing severe hypoglycemia or hypoglycemia and they're having cognitive deficiency, then they may not be able to walk by themselves or eat or talk or provide self-care and therefore type one is recognized as a disability. The purpose of disability rights laws is to level the playing field. And so there are three key federal laws, the Americans with Disabilities Act, commonly referred to as ADA, Section 504 of the Rehabilitation Act, known as Section 504, and the Individuals with Disabilities Education Act, known as IDEA. So we're gonna talk about each one of these, and believe me, I could tell you a whole lot more than I'm gonna, and I also have notes for you guys to get copies of these presentations and some resources, uh, but feel free to ask questions uh, to Kaler or on Facebook as you as I explain all this. So the first law we're gonna talk about is the Americans with Disabilities Act. It prohibits discrimination on the basis of disability. And it requires an entity to make reasonable modifications to facilitate equal access, unless doing so would cause an undue burden, resulting in a fundamental alteration to the program or service. And I'll tell you that undue burden is challenging to prove um, for a good reason, because the whole intent of this law is to facilitate equal access. And examples of entities to whom which this law applies is very, very broad. Uh, it could be daycare, childcare, preschools, public schools, private schools that are uh, non-religious, um, colleges and universities, after school programs that are run by a third party like Tony Soccer Camp, um, enrichment programs, sports programs, summer camps, and employment. So it's a very, very broad spectrum of coverage. The next federal law we're gonna talk about is Section 504 of the Rehabilitation Act. It prohibits discrimination on the basis of disability. Schools that receive government funds, whether public or private, but government funds must provide. And these are five key things to keep in your head whenever you're talking about your child's rights. A free, appropriate public education, known as FAPE, equal to non-disabled peers with reasonable accommodations, including related aids and healthcare services, all of which is to be delivered in the least restrictive manner. And so these terms uh, should be used in your uh, dialogue with the school, they're a way to assess if your child's rights are intact and that the 504 plan that you create with the school or IEP plan is really honoring your child's right to receive all of these things. Section 504 also says that the school should ideally seek and identify students who are eligible for protections under this law and to provide written notice to inform parents of their rights and a meeting time that is mutually acceptable to all parties involved and to convene a 504 team of people 
who are deemed knowledgeable about your child. Typically, the 504 team is comprised of the 504 on-site coordinator, um, the teachers who have direct supervisory responsibility for your child, the school nurse or health aide, um, possibly a school psychologist and others, and you all gather together. And the parents are also to be afforded a meaningful role because who knows more about the child than you. And the team is to take all facts into consideration and they are to consider the individualized needs of that child to come up with an individualized plan. They are to create a written plan of accommodations and that plan should articulate how will the school accommodate the student. It's to address both academic and non-academic needs. And Section 504 also should afford due process so that if there is a conflict or disagreement, um, that there is a means in which to resolve that conflict. And really it encourages and supports schools, <coughs> excuse me, to seek compliance. Here's some other fun facts. Did you know about Section 504? Did you know that written physician's orders help to define appropriate care? It's not the only piece, but it's an important foundational piece. Parents may not be required to provide care. Students may not be required to go to a non-neighborhood school because of disability-related Accommodations apply to all school activities. Schools are prohibited from aiding, perpetuating, or having any relationship with an entity that is discriminating on the basis of disability. And I'm gonna be honest that I think the, the most common uh, problem I see uh, often is after school programs uh, that are run by an outside entity on school property. Um, there is no limit to the length of a 504 plan. If you need six pages or two pages, whatever it is, that is not to be restricted because of a school form. Because in effect, that would not be individualized, would it? Every school must have an on-site 504 coordinator. <coughs> Blanket policy is prohibited. Any kind of language like all of our kids with diabetes must do X, uh, that's a red flag right there. Um, each child's needs are to be met on an individualized basis. Financial burden is not a valid defense for a school's failure to comply. If, for example, a school says, well, we don't have money to have a nurse at your school, that does not relieve the school of its responsibility to provide for your child. And the school may implement a plan without your consent. And I know you might be scratching your head wondering why would that be? And again, that's about making this whole process child-centric. The school, in theory, uh, in application, should be acting in the best interest of the child, just like the parent and just like the medical team. And that's a, a, a sort of a system of check and balance if it's a, a implemented and honored properly. The third law is the Individuals with Disabilities Education Act, which is not an anti-discrimination law. It ensures a student's ability to access education. And it is uh, applied when a disability is having a profound impact on learning. Um, this is the process that leads to an IEP with very specific milestones and strategies for how to facilitate the student's access to learn. Um, there's very specific reporting periods and timeframes which in, within which the school must respond 
to any concerns um, and keep up to date on how the child is doing. Most often we think about IEPs as uh, for children who have diagnosed learning differences like ADD, ADHD, autism spectrum disorder, dyslexia, uh, speech disorders, processing disorders, but it can also apply to a child with type one if the condition is having a profound impact on learning. And in that instance, if a child, oh, and also if a child with type one was diagnosed with a learning difference, they would have an IEP. And a child would not have a 504 and an IEP. Whatever would have gone into the 504 goes instead into the IEP. So for folks who have an IEP or your child might be eligible for one, when I talk about 504 from this point forward, understand that it could also just, you know, apply to an IEP. Um, now we're going to just narrow down to California state laws. And I'm not going to go through all of this in great detail, but there is uh, state laws are called ed code. And these are the specific numbers of ed code and what they say. Um, the ones that I really want to focus on here are 49414.5, which permits training of volunteer school personnel to administer glucagon. And importantly, it permits students to do BG checks and self care in any location at any time assuming that the child has those skills. And I, I think it's important to acknowledge that children acquire those skills in bits and pieces over time. And to the extent that a child uh, is able to do those bits and pieces in any location at any time is the ideal, and that is best practice to normalize diabetes care and integrate it into the school day. 49423, and this is an important one, authorizes the school nurse or other designated personnel to administer medication. 49423.5, and I want to talk about this in a minute. This is for students with IEPs. It allows a school nurse to delegate specialized healthcare services. I want to be very clear, this does not generally apply to a child with type 1 diabetes because type 1 diabetes is not considered a specialized healthcare service based on the California Supreme Court ruling in 2013. And I'll talk about that in a minute. And the last one is that parents must inform school of doctors, meds, dosing. Uh, that means providing a form from your healthcare provider to the school and keeping that up to date. So let's talk about the California Supreme Court ruling. This was a very important case. Um, a landmark decision, unanimous ruling uh, between uh, nursing organizations and uh, the California Department of Education. Uh, it resulted out of a bunch of districts uh, that were not um, administering insulin to students with diabetes. And thank God for the American Diabetes Association and the Disability Rights Education and Defense Fund, DREDF. ADA and DREDF championed the rights of children with diabetes in California by answering this legal question, who may administer insulin to students with diabetes in California K-12 schools? And the court said, existing law does allow non-licensed school personnel to be trained to administer insulin for those times 
when no nurse is available. And available means at the time your child needs the medication. The school personnel must consent, the parent must consent, and the treating physician must consent. And this provides schools in California with a viable option to safely train personnel to administer insulin. It is done in schools all across the country safely. And the administration of insulin, as we all know as parents, the vast majority of people who administer insulin are trained lay people like you and me. And it is possible. Especially in light of the fact that there is a severe shortage of nurses in schools, both in California and across the country, we want to make the best use of our school nurses so that they can be a vital resource, but also empower our school personnel to feel confident and able and skilled to be able to provide care to children with diabetes. And so after the court ruling, there was a joint statement issued by the California School Nurses Organization, the American Nurses Association, the California chapter of ANA, and the American Diabetes Association. And it was a wonderful partnership to be able to say children with diabetes do absolutely need and deserve to receive timely, appropriate care, and that there needs to be people on site who are trained to immediately assist the child and to create that safety net of support. Importantly, I want to make clear to families, the term school nurse means that that person has an RN or greater licensure as defined in California Code of Regulations. Other designated school personnel can be a licensed vocational nurse, a health aide, teachers, other staff, office front workers, but someone that everybody feels it's a realistic situation and that everybody is partnering together to make this successful. I should also add that a school district may choose to have a nurse only policy, but it's important to know no policy or practice may impede a child's access to appropriate care based on their child's physician's orders. These are the written plans that a child should have for school and who is involved with creating them. There's treating physician's orders that then, and then the, as you know, those forms um, are, you know, check boxes and stuff. And there's a lot of instruction that your physician uh, gives you verbally and that can best be captured in a diabetes medical management plan that is uh, consistent with the physician's orders, not changing it, but adding in all that language, like if blood sugar is below X, then don't give insulin until after the child has started eating. Um, there's an individual healthcare plan. So usually the school gets the doctor's orders from you and the diabetes medical management plan and translates that into a school healthcare plan. You as parents absolutely should work closely with your school nurse to make sure that that plan has every bit of detail that needs to be in there to ensure your child's safety. A one page quick reference sheet. Um, this is, you know, a quick thing. Have a picture of your child, maybe a picture of their backpack or their diabetes kit and then emergency contact numbers and names, and then signs and symptoms of a high and a low, real quick. Just a couple bullet points. 
and um, just enough for somebody to have on their desk, a teacher to have on their desk as, as backup. It doesn't replace any other documents, but it's there as backup. And then the most important, the granddaddy, is the plan of accommodations, whether it's expressed in a 504 or an IEP plan. In a 504 plan, words matter. And you want it to address who, what, when, where, how, and why. And for that reason alone, I cannot emphasize enough use the ADA DREDF Sample 504 plan. This plan was created by legal uh, folks at the American Diabetes Association and DREDF. The language is very intentional. It puts it squarely on how will the school accommodate the student. There's lots of other 504 plans out there. I would tell you that this is a great starting point. It, it, to me, it's the Mercedes Benz. And you start there and then develop a proposed plan of accommodations that's tailored to your child's individualized needs. So let's look at language because words matter. Vague language like school to help Emma with care can become much clearer if it says at least two to three people will be identified as trained diabetes personnel who are trained in all aspects of care, and at least one of those people will be on site at all times. Vague language of Emma checks BG at snack lunch PE. Clear language. The TDP will assist and or supervise Emma in the classroom with both scheduled snack lunch PE and unscheduled BG checks per the written physician orders. I think you guys get the idea. Why do you want to have a 504 plan? I put up the word trust because if I think about any other relationships in my life, whether it's with my husband, my children, my friends, my work relationships, all of those are built on trust. And that's what a 504 plan really helps to uh, build with your school and it defines the responsibilities and expectations for everybody involved. It builds this positive partnership because everybody's got skin in the game. It protects your child's rights. It builds everybody's confidence, including your child, because your child knows that there's always somebody there who they can turn to for diabetes help. And it creates enduring positivity for your child, most importantly, but for everyone. It supports school compliance. It definitely preempts problems. It overall builds success. So if you don't have a 504 plan, I highly recommend it. It's an insurance plan to make everyone do the right thing. How do you do a 504 plan process? Well, I've got my little guy up in the left-hand corner there. Plan. Rule number one, and I cannot say this enough, all communications must be in writing. Be well prepared. Never assume anything. Ask questions. Who, what, when, where, how, why. Make sure that there is no rock left unturned. Be respectful, listen carefully, educate the educators when they are, you know, they, they've got a lot of responsibilities and especially as we are now in the era of COVID, that is going to be even more true. But don't assume they know anything about type one diabetes and certainly they don't know anything about type one diabetes in your child. And so it's your job to educate the educators. Work up the chain of command if you have issues. Read every document carefully and keep copies. I cannot emphasize that point enough. Remember that language matters. Prepare to negotiate and keep trying. Don't give in. This is your child. 
give your child a voice. Know when to seek help. Your endo team, they are no strangers to being of help and making a well-placed phone call to schools. Schools can also benefit from having that dialogue. Only sign a document when you fully support it. It is a legal document. Take it seriously and read everything carefully. If you don't agree with everything and you're still trying to work things out, you can note on the document, these are the items that are still outstanding, but we're gonna implement those things that we already agree to and that we will reconvene. And that's the, and, and write down, this is the next step that's agreed to. And then you can sign it. And then you'll have a clear follow-up action because everything is documented. So how do you go about this whole process? Again, with planning. So at least six weeks before school starts, at least be kind to your medical team. Give them time to turn around the school forms. They can't do it in a day, they can't do it in a week, and they can't do it in two weeks. So give them advance notice, work with them, make sure that if there is something that you're finding is an issue with school, that they're not doing something in a timely manner, get those time frames included. Whatever issues you have, talk with your medical team, they're there to help you. Make sure the language is as detailed as possible. Once you have your orders, like a Pavlovian dog, the beginning of July every year, you send a letter off to the school or an email, but make sure it's in writing, no conversations. This is to request a 504 team meeting before school starts, to have TDP training before school starts, and you're addressing this communication to the principal, who's the chief administrator of the building. The school nurse is part of the 504 team. It's the principal who has the chief administration responsibilities. Days before school starts, after you've confirmed the meeting time, all of you get together. In this day and age, it's pretty hard for schools to actually have a 504 plan approved and done before school. So I think it's reasonable to say you should definitely meet with all the teachers at one time to explain diabetes in your child, what are the care needs, and to make sure that your child is safe, that there's trained people before the first day of school supplies on site, and that there is an agreement that within the first two weeks or so of school, that there will be a 504 meeting to get those accommodations in place lickety split and not to let that drag out and hold them accountable if it is. For COVID-19, as there is with general, it starts with national policy. And that is set by the CDC and the US Department of Ed Office for Civil Rights, and there are national position statements that are set by the American Academy of Pediatrics and the American Diabetes Association for our children. That then trickles down to the state, county, and community levels, to your state, county, and public health departments, to your healthcare provider, who usually will follow the guidance of the national position statement of the uh, American Academy of Pediatrics and the ADA. And then that trickles down even further to your county department of ed, your school district. And you'll also hear position statements from labor unions as well, um, just to understand the puzzle and how that all fits together. So I'm just gonna go very quickly over what might be COVID related uh, additional considerations, but Tariq is also gonna cover this as well. You wanna talk with your medical team and identify what might be 
health and safety issues or barriers to your child being in school. Sorry about that. Um, and the most important thing here, folks, is in this pandemic time, the process of determining whether your child is going to be at school or not is highly individualized and very child and family specific. So while it may be beneficial to discuss things with other families, do not judge another family's decision as their variables are unique to them. Not everyone will have the ability to have their child stay at home. Not everyone will have the ability to provide alternatives if they are at home. And we are all in this together. Your plan should build flexibility and adaptability with either in-person or home or hybrid learning, however you determine. If you're at home, make sure that you include those services and supplies that your child would have received had your child been at school. You also want to include additional sick days. Staff to receive coronavirus training before school starts. Educate students and staff about parents and masks, and parents, I'm sorry, about masks, washing hands, six foot social distancing, keeping separate pods, protocols for notifying you immediately if someone is COVID positive in your child's class or a teacher or in the building. Uh, that there to, is to be small in-person group learning, preferably outdoors, that there should be a of any shared tactile objects, musical instruments. Um, you want to get very specific in your plans about uh, what is the frequency of uh, the school's plan to do sanitizing and deep cleaning in the classrooms and in the bathrooms. <clears throat> and it's not enough for it to just be a general policy in the school. This is specific to your child and it should be included in the plan. <coughs> there should be distancing of desks, staggered arrival and playtimes, hygiene supplies, wellness spaces away from sick children. Your child should not be going to an office with other sick children. And the school should be ideally treating your child where your child is to limit the amount of disruption to your child's learning, keep your child as minimally con in contact with any other children besides those your child is assigned to be with. You should also ask about what is the location now for eating snacks and meals? How's that all gonna be played out? And what about PPE for staff and for students in need? What is the school doing to uh, address that uh, because it ultimately impacts your child. I just wanna say we're all in this together. I know that sometimes it can seem awfully puzzling to get from point A to point B, but we're here as a community and we're in this together and uh, that we can lift ourselves up and be the caring, wonderful diabetes community that we are. If there are any questions at this time. Um... Thanks, Lisa. All right, I just, that was a lot of content. So if you're feeling like you didn't get it all down, I just wanna remind people that I am gonna send out the presentations after um, afterwards. So it'll be in an email to you as well as a recording will also be posted on our website. So please don't feel, um, if you missed anything, don't feel stressed about that. Yeah, there's a, there is a, in the email will also be resources with links to all kinds of information I didn't even talk about. So just 
Don't fret. Thanks. Excellent. All right. I have a couple questions that came in over the chat. Um, I'm just going to maybe pull two of them for now because I know we, we need to move on to Tark's session and then if we have more time we can come back to these other ones. Um, so one question was about how specific the language needs to be. So the question was that a new school nurse came in in the middle of the year and when um, this child was having a severe low blood sugar the nurse refused to give glucagon because it wasn't specifically written in the 504 plan. So the question is was she right because she was following the plan or was that something that she should have been able to deliver? Without knowing all the details of the situation, it would be wrong for me to say right or wrong. I'm going to guess the doctor's orders said to administer glucagon if the child was experiencing symptoms of severe hypoglycemia. In that instance, assuming that you know that good practices of diabetes care, you administer glucagon. And so if that didn't happen, that's a red flag to me that the language needs to be more detailed in the doctor's orders. Doctor's orders include medication name, the time, the dosing. I know that in diabetes land, it's variable in terms of when you give insulin and how much. Um, but as best you can give detailed guidelines and instructions, and also for nurses, they need to understand that adaptability and flexibility and understanding best practices care and to call the medical team with the parent if they have questions and partnering with the parent to call the doctor is best practice. Thank you. Um, okay, we have a couple, we've had a couple of questions come in about religious private schools and if they are required to recognize a 504 plan and if that differs if they received federal funding through the um, PPP loans. So any school that is a recipient of government money means Section 504 kicks in. Excellent. Okay, um, I think that, okay, one other question about if, um, if they plan on having, so we plan on having our child stay home with distance learning for now, but should we have, should we make a 504 plan that covers both at home and in-person school accommodations um, in case yes, they end up going back? Excellent question. I think all of us right now, many of us in California reside in counties that are not starting with in-person learning, but may very well move to that as the year progresses. It is wise to include everything now up front so that when the switch gets flicked and you are in a position of determining whether your child is going to go to school or not, whether it's part-time or full-time, everything is already in place. Excellent. All right, there are some more specific ones, but I'm going to skip them right now, um, and people, hopefully we'll have time. People at can the... email me at lshenson at hotmail.com, and I'm glad to answer your specific questions. Perfect. Thanks. Thank you so much, Lisa. We're now going to turn it over to Dr. Ahmad, who's going to address some of the COVID specifics. So again, I'm going to remind people as we move into this next section, if you have questions, um, you can feel free to send them to me in the chat box, and then I'll try to group them together and ask the ones that benefit the most people, and then we'll get those individual ones answered um, after the presentation as well. Dr. Ahmad. <laughs> So we're super mean, right? We don't give any breaks. We make you guys sit right through and go to the next presentation right away. And um, so that said, I hope you guys can still have dinner. I know we're going into the evening, so I, I, I hate to say it, but it, consider this like a dinner show, probably the worst dinner show you're ever going to see, um, but informative nonetheless. And I want to thank Lisa for her presentation. A lot of, a lot of what Kayler and and Lisa has done, and hopefully what I'll do too, is kind of empower you as parents and, and students and children uh, to kind of deal with the situations that are existing now. 
Um, so my topic will be on COVID. Um, I do want to say a really quick thing also about um, something called TrialNet. Um, we as uh, physicians and researchers um, have learned so much about diabetes management and type 1 diabetes from um, uh, research studies like TrialNet. Um, for those who are not aware of TrialNet, it's a screening um, uh, research study done internationally um, to identify individuals of uh, type 1 uh, individuals. Uh, so therefore, first degree relatives and second degree relatives. And TrialNet, through this COVID um, era, is actually um, so flexible that they allow for screening to be done even at home. So if you have uh, individuals who are interested in getting screened, um, for those who are first degree relatives, two and a half to 40 years, uh, 45 years old, and those who are second degree relatives, two and a half to 20 years old, um, you can go to trialnet.org and then they can even mail you uh, the blood kit um, so that you can uh, do it from home. Um, alternatively, you can also do it at commercial labs like Quest or LabCorp, and that, that's free, actually, that's screening. Um, so that will help I identify individuals uh, for potential even prevention trials in the future. So uh, with that said, um, let's jump into this topic of T1D coronavirus and school readiness. Uh, again, thank you, Kayla and Lisa, for allowing me to present this topic, and I'm sure it's on the minds of everybody right now. Um, let me do a few quick disclosures. I have no current or potential conflict of interest in relation to this presentation, and I do have to thank my infectious disease colleagues at UCSF Benioff Children's Hospital Oakland, um, Dr. Prachi Singh and Dr. Ann Petru have not only helped put together some of the slides that you're gonna see, um, but they've also been a great curbside for my own family um, as we navigate through these times. Um, illnesses, illnesses come up, uh, travel plans come up, and I've been uh, curbsiding them on so many things. And certainly if there's questions that arise today, um, that I am not able to answer or address. I am um, I literally have them in my pocket and my cell phone So I can always get the answer pretty quick and as my last disclosure. I am NOT dr. Fauci, so I am NOT going to be uh, All-knowing when it comes to this particular virus and I humbly say this um, That said I do hope to have some goals uh, achieved today for all of you um, I want to just review some facts about COVID-19 and then understand that relationship between COVID-19 and T1D. Of course, that is what's driving us here today is our, our um, relationship to type 1 diabetes. And then I'm just going to review the guidelines recommended for safe school reentry in the age of COVID-19. Now, the first slide is probably the most political that I'll get to, and then we'll throw all the politics to the side. But the truth is, you know, why are we having this meeting right now? And, and why is there so much confusion? On school reopenings. Um, Lisa kind of brilliantly showed through her diagrams the, the hierarchy that exists and how we look to federal institutions and national organizations for policy making. And if you go to the websites, interestingly, for AAP uh, and the CDC, which I have done, um, you will find a lot of guidelines on how we're going to navigate uh, through this era and how we're going to go to school entry, re-entry safely. What you don't see are the criteria by which there is going to be school or there's not going to be school because they left it up to the local school districts and the state. Um, alternatively, the state and the school districts have to look to federal institutions for guidance. They are a behemoth institution with a lot of data coming into them. So they also look for, to them to understand what criteria to use to make such decisions. And really, this is kind of the flux. This is the paradox. We, we have individuals looking to the Fed to try to understand when should we close school districts and yet at the same time the Fed's going to the state saying well why don't you make the decisions on your own um, and so we're going to talk about California specifically I don't know if we have people logging in from other states but certainly uh, Governor Newsom helped uh, us guide our path in a lot of ways by the mandate he made last Friday so we will talk about that of course, what's confusing everything too is the mixed messaging, right? On mask use, interestingly, um, and I put the date here, July 13th, um, the Orange County Board of Education actually uh, mentioned this quote, that K through 12 children represent the lowest risk cohort for COVID-19. Because of that fact, 
social distancing and masking of children is unnecessary and therefore not recommended. I kid you not, that was from the Orange County um, paper, the white paper. And then on morbidity, morbidity in children, again, just as recent as July 20th of this year, Missouri governor mentioned in his quote that the kids can go to school because quote, they're going to get over it. And um, our very own president on July 26th, uh, or sorry, 22nd, um, mentioned this quote on transmission. Uh, now they, being the children, don't catch it easily. They, being the children, don't bring it home easily. And if they do catch it, they get better fast. We're looking at that fact, okay? It's funny he calls it a fact, but they have to look into it still and investigate it. So that's as po political as I'm gonna get. Um, and I'm now gonna go into kind of the, the talk of what we do know, or at least what little we know. There are many types of coronavirus, and this is a novel one. COVID-19 is the name because it was uh, named in the year 2019. But because it's so new, we're learning so much about it and we're continuing to learn more about it, even on a week to week basis. Um, SARS-CoV-2 is the actual name of the virus, um, and COVID-19 is the actual disease. Okay, so that's just semantics. The incubation time, as you probably have already been told on media, websites, and the news, is, is pretty accurate. Incubation seems to be approximately 14 days. Again, that's, that's what we've assumed, um, and that may change as time goes on. In China, children are noted to have a shorter incubation time. Uh-oh. And uh, the truth is, we don't know the true prevalence, and, and this comes about because of our lack of testing. If we're not able to test uh, individuals in a given population, we can't identify truly how many people have it, and then prevalence cannot be established. Incidence can be established, but not prevalence. And as of April 2nd, 2020, among pediatrics, high risk, high risk for COVID-19 infection was considered to be less than one year old, the immunocompromised, those with heart problems or chronic lung disease. And that was as of April 2nd, 2020. Of note, again, among pediatrics, notice that they didn't mention type one diabetes. So that's why I put that there. And then my last point about what little we know, and that is the testing. We, we actually don't have the best test. We have the test that we have been given. This is an example of the testing curves for what you probably know as the nasal pharyngeal swab, the little Q-tip thing that they stick through your nose and tickle the back of your throat with. Um, I have not had a nasal pharyngeal swab since I was a resident, but my wife had one uh, last week and she still feels the burning of that solvent. It's not, it's not the greatest experience. Here's the key though. If individuals get tested before the onset of symptoms, there is a likelihood that they will have a, a negative test, even though they may carry the virus. So that's why you may have been told that if you get symptoms, that is the time to get the test. Because as you can see from the blue curve here, that is gonna be the most likely time that you're gonna get a positive test, all right? And then as time goes on, you get into this area where the swab may not catch it. Now there's other ways to look at the um, identification for the virus. Some people will do, um, uh, the antibody testing that you may have heard. And it's represented here by the dash lines. And you can see here with these dash lines, just how inaccurate that testing can be and how variable it can be. And look at the long duration that you get when you get the positive test, it's between two and three weeks after the test has, uh, after you've been symptomatic. So that's after the fact. And, and during that time prior, you may have been shedding the virus the whole time. So, as far as diabetes is concerned, when you were told back in the early part of this year that it is a risk category and, and the CDC and the media and the newspapers kind of jumped on this, mentioning that diabetes was a risk category, it came from the fact that many individuals who were sick at that time did have diabetes. Of course, they did not specify what type of diabetes they had. Type two diabetes we know is a risk category for the coronavirus and it kind of makes sense now that we've gone five six months later from that initial time period type 2 diabetes is found mostly in adults it is the most common form of diabetes 90 percent of all the diabetes in the u.s is type 2 and the other comorbidities that are often associated with this are all risk categories being overweight having obstructive sleep apnea having these comorbidities are going to make you more sick if you should get COVID-19 and more vulnerable should you uh, 
have an exposure to COVID-19 or to coronavirus. Now, as I mentioned before, hyperglycemia and obesity are these risk categories that we think about. And that theorized uh, is to be because of the increased circulation of inflammatory markers during these states of having high blood sugars and obesity. And as we know, uh, COVID-19 is a condition which really is associated with this hyperinflammatory response during the condition. This is a study done uh, that was published in Lancet looking at kids and their signs and symptoms that they had. And you can see it's very variable, the types of symptoms that they may have, cough, fever, sore throat, headache, et cetera. What's not listed here, but now we're finding out too, is also loss of taste and loss of smell. So that's also something to think about when we're um, screening our kids um, as we get into that point where um, we're doing our passive screening as these kids go back to school or going to go into school eventually. Interestingly, as has been told in the media and uh, various organizations, the number of individuals or the percent of individuals in the pediatric population who exhibit these signs are much lower than that of an adult. So, just looking at fever, cough, or shortness of breath, you can see 73% versus 93% in adults. And that goes for all the symptom categories. The only one that's a little bit similar is the runny nose that you can see here. But really, the, the point is, is that the symptoms are just more mild. And if you look at the severity of the disease among kids, this is a, a pie graph looking at, again, only kids, not adults, but only kids, that individuals who are asymptomatic are almost a third of the kids, uh, and these are all kids who have the disease, who have COVID-19, 30% of them won't have any symptoms. And the severe cases, zero to 5%, um, is still a small piece of the pie. Only 2% uh, demand an ICU admission. So you do have a bulk who have moderate or mild symptoms, so they could be mild fever, uh, fatigue, cough, etc. Why do children, children have milder disease? Well, this is kind of the billion dollar question, right? What makes children so strong um, and able to fight this? And theories are being thrown around. And, and of course, as time goes on, because again, this is a new virus, we're gonna to have to learn what it is about the immune system in these kids that are helping fight it. Um, could the fact that just because they're younger and have fewer comorbidities make them have healthier lungs? Could it be that the viral pathogenic pathway is similar to that of the other coronaviruses? So example, for example, um, SARS, which you may have heard of, um, severe acute respiratory syndrome virus, SARS, and MERS, Middle Eastern respiratory syndrome virus, they come from the same family and they also have a milder course in children. Is there something to do with something called the ACE2 receptor, which you might hear more and more about as we go into, again, future studies uh, regarding this virus? ACE2 receptor is a receptor that the coronavirus needs in order to enter cells and do their destruction. Um, and what you find is that there's not much ACE2 receptor expression in younger individuals, particularly if you're less than 10 years old. And that's super interesting, as I will discuss later, because there's just this week uh, the release of a, a study done in South Korea, a very large study that revealed that individuals who are less than 10 years old were less likely to transmit the virus should they have COVID-19. However, there's a, another important finding in the study that those individuals 10 to 20 years old had the same transmission rate as those adults who are over 40. Okay, so that's a, that's a key study that just came out even just this week. There's prior exposure to other coronavirus, altered the disease course. So these are all these theories that we have to kind of consider, but we don't know for sure. The statistics are there that if you look at United States, if you look at China, if you look at Italy, Italy and you look at Spain, it is much lower in this age population. But again, I put fewer with an asterisk because we have to be careful how we're interpreting this. Could it be other confounding factors taking place? Could it be because they're shelter in place that they're not getting exposed to the virus? Or, or truly, is it something to do with their immune system that makes them better at fighting it? Um, so we, and then also when we're doing the testing, Again, we're not testing everybody. So if they don't have symptoms, they can still have the virus, but we're not including them as part of that uh, count. So we have to be cautious. And I say that because we don't know, again, a lot about this virus. We don't know what long-term sequelae may occur. Could, for instance, those asymptomatic individuals 
have chronic respiratory problems in the future. I showed this slide here on the right, this picture, because in D, what you find is this child is actually asymptomatic, but they have a classic, what we call ground glass appearance in this right lower lung. I know it's, this is the right, but in CT scans, this is, this is the right lung. And this is someone who doesn't have symptoms. At least they didn't have symptoms at the time of that particular picture. Could there also be links to chronic fatigue syndrome in the future? Like we see with Lyme disease, for instance. Could there be neurologic sequelae? Could there be blood clots and heart damage that can occur in the future? We just don't know. And I think it's very premature, and I think it's very, very dangerous to just say that the kids, as the Missouri governor said, will get sick and get over it. Because as they may get over it, we don't know what long-term damage may occur or what long-term risk these kids are at. So as more kids are released from shelter in place, the numbers may change and the findings may change as well. So going to type 1D in COVID, um, I just wanna make some comments that we, we have to get out of the way. That current evidence suggests that individuals with well-managed T1D are not at higher risk of contracting COVID-19. This is, uh, like I said from the beginning, um, a big question on the minds of our type 1 diabe diabetes population. Um, I can't say the same for type 2 diabetes. So if, if we have a, a sibling or if we have a child in our family who has type 2 diabetes, this is a different scenario. Um, and I actually would put the type 1, or the, sorry, the type 2 diabetes individual in that high-risk category. But so far, the evidence does not show that in T1D, particularly if the glycemic control is in good control, um, and that even if they do get COVID-19, that is the, the individual with type 1 diabetes, they are not necessarily at risk, higher risk for serious complications from the disease. So the those that we do consider or that we have to be careful about are those who are consistently having elevated blood sugars and those with a second chronic disease, whether it's asthma or some lung, uh, chronic lung disease or heart disease. And we know that those individuals are already at risk for any other virus, that, that we know. So throwing COVID into the mix is obviously gonna be um, a same risk category. And now more than ever, um, we, and I don't have any stock in any of these CGM hybrid closed loops or in any sensor technology, but now more than ever, I think we need to kind of rely on technologies, particularly telehealth, because we're not able to go to clinics as often as we did before, but we still can be tied to our care providers via these uh, links. And I have my GIF here because this is um, going to be a time when we are in the future and we kind of look back and realize that it was almost primitive the way we kind of took care of diabetes, whether it was poking fingers with a lancet um, or having to, you know, go in person uh, to the clinic when in actuality, a lot of us are going to be doing telehealth in the future. All right, can I ask oh, a quick question oh, that is coming yeah. up in the chats? Um, what is considered well-managed, especially for like an adolescent? <laughs> yeah, so going back to the, these quotes, the, this is from um, websites in the ADA and the JDRF, and well-managed um, is, is, a, is a, a definition that's ambiguous on purpose. Um, the idea being that I would not use A1C, for instance, as someone who defines well-managed because you can have an individual who may have a high A1C, but over the last few months, or even the last few weeks for that matter, may have had sugars in a, a glycemic control that's in the target of 80 to 180, let's say. All right. Um, and so if, if you have an individual who's chronically above 250, then I would be concerned that they are oftentimes in a situation where they're not only above 250, but now they're polyuric. Um, being hyperglycemic is gonna cause an increase in inflammatory markers. Um, this is gonna be someone who might be more prone to getting bacterial infections like cellulitis from their infusion sets or also fungal infections. Um, so not only are they at risk for COVID-19, but they're at, they're at risk for those other bacterial and fungal infections. So that's what I would, define as glycemic control is someone who's trying to stay within their goal targets um, even if it's in the more recent um, present um, that they would be considered in good control i hope that answers the question um, and it's a good question 
But, and if I can be more broad, uh, just to say, and as I've been telling my families, because this question is coming up, again, now if someone has an A1C that's in the teens, a hemoglobin A1C in the teens, and this has been going on visit after visit, again, that's not good glycemic control, right? So this is not someone who's um, in the teens and then has brought down their average blood sugar based on their CGM in the last couple of weeks. This is someone who keeps coming back to me uh, with higher hemoglobin A1C. So I have to be more cautious about that individual. But again, we don't have data even then to show that that particular individual is that much um, at greater risk. That may change as we do, again, shelter in place opens up and we get more of these kids who go out into the um, population and into uh, the schools and then may, may get the virus. Um, so I guess, I'll, uh, again, I'll just say that it's important that we use what technologies we have to continue to monitor our blood sugars and and realize, and I don't know if everybody knows this, but the average A1C of a teenager with type 1 diabetes in the United States is 9%. And so, you know, even those individuals, and I hope they don't think that they're doing a bad job if they're just because they're 9% that they're doing a bad job. It's not that, it's not that easy to just translate. Um, there are other things going on in, in that particular individual and everybody is individualized. So to understand glycemic control, it is still very individual. Um, how to understand if, you, if you're used, using numbers strictly, you kind of get into, um, into, into trouble and I don't want to put anybody into a, a particular box. Um, so I put this uh, picture here from the CDC website. Um, this is from July 17th, this is just last Friday. And what I like to see now is that they changed the language, right? So now you can see here, people of any following condition are at increased risk. Now notice they don't put diabetes anymore. They specifically put type two diabetes. I thought that was really neat. That was not there even uh, a couple weeks ago because I was going back and checking the website. Um, interestingly, they did uh, want us to cover their bases, I guess. So they put it as a might be at increased risk. So whether they'll eliminate it from this list or not, I don't know in the coming future. And again, we just don't have a lot of data on type one diabetes and coronavirus. There is this publication um, that has come out that described individuals with type one diabetes uh, among 64 US endo clinics and had coronavirus as well. So they had to go to 64 endo clinics and even then with all those clinics, they could only find 33 positive cases. So the number is very small. And mind you, this is all type ones, not just kids. So the average age of the individuals who had uh, the COVID positive test were 25 years old. So again, not a lot of them were in the young adult uh, teenage kind of years. But interestingly, and we can still learn from this, is that there was a lot of hyperglycemia. In fact, that was the most frequent um, symptom that these individuals had. And I think we can, learn that individuals who are going to be COVID, COVID positive um, and, they, and there are going to be some type ones that have become COVID positive, it's just statistics given the prevalence of this particular condition, have to be aware that their glucose control may be very high and that they may need more insulin during that time. But the idea being, as with any sick day management strategy, that more frequent testing will occur and more insulin administration may need to be given or at a higher dose in order to combat that hyperglycemia. If you do those things, it would be difficult to go into diabetic ketoacidosis. Because as we all know, as type one diabetes community, it's the, insulin, it's the insulinopenia or the lack of insulin that pushes one into ketoacidosis along with dehydration. So this is just the tip of the iceberg. We really have to get more data and we will get more data. There's an ongoing registry right now that's actually uh, international, um, collecting as much data, data as we can on those with type 1 diabetes and coronavirus. So the things that you have to still be aware of with type 1 diabetes in this age of COVID, and, and again, hopefully many of you know this already, but T1D is not equal to someone who's immunocompromised, all right? As I've told many of my new families too, um, in fact, the immune system is so good in type 1 diabetes, it was able to destroy the pancreas, right? I mean, that's how good the T cells were. So the, the T cells work just fine. Um, they just got confused and attacked the islet cells of, of your child or yourself if you have type 1 diabetes. So you're not immunocompromised. Now, when you're sheltering at home, there is going to be changes in activity, 
right? And changes to your overall day-to-day -day routine. So being less active, maybe snacking more just from being bored, you might have noticed your kid or your own uh, glycemic control if you have T1D kind of go up and your insulin needs need to go up during that time as well. Be prepared for, again, how coronavirus has affected our society. Delays in, in supplies that may have to be, that you rely on that come in the mail. Be prepared that there may be those delays and you may have to be um, thinking ahead as far as your supplies. Um, any viral illness, COVID, influenza, et cetera, can still lead to DKA. So as I mentioned before, there are gonna be the steps, the sick day management steps that you've been taught by your provider that you're gonna take. And the diabetes medical management plan, as Lisa has already pointed out, and the AEPs should still be filled because we don't know how long we may be uh, you know, at home and then going to school. You wanna have it all um, done ahead of time. So there's still a lot we don't know regarding T1D and COVID, um, but together we're gonna to find out. And that's the key thing. And Lisa mentioned this all already that we really are doing this together. And the reason why I put this picture together is because it's not just about T1D anymore and coronavirus. It really is about all kids and coronavirus. And many of our families that are participating in this uh, meeting right now don't have just one kid with T1D, they have many kids who may or may not have T1D, but they all really need to be approached the same way. And so with that said, I'm gonna jump more into the topic of the schools and how we're dealing with that. Because it's without a doubt, in-person schooling is important. We can, we can know that the socialization, just perhaps having our kids at home and realize their lack of socialization, it may have caused some differences in the way they are able to um, interact with other individuals. Now, I can speak for my own kids who do a lot of FaceTime and do a lot of things with Roblox and with Minecraft that they can still socialize with other kids. But it's very different, for instance, in the teenager who needs maybe more physical interaction with just hanging out with their friends, etc. So a lot of the things that we're gonna be talking about when it comes to policy, when it comes to benefits, Etc. as Lisa pointed out, is very individualized because what may be more beneficial to one person because of their age or because of their maturity, et cetera, may be very different to another. Um, again, the socialization being in person, I can say that my kids are not losing out that much. At least they don't feel like they're losing out that much because of how much FaceTime and how much interaction they still get on, on the video. Was it, you know, whether it's good or not, that's a whole other story, but we won't go there. Identification of learning issues is also super important when you have in-person learning, right? You can identify faster any learning issues that might arise. And we can't ignore food insecurity and childcare. Um, and again, as Lisa pointed out, every family is different and there's a large population that rely on schools and their meal plans to provide that food for breakfast and for lunch. And they may be missing out on it with the in, if the in-person school is not taking place. Now, we're gonna talk about that later because in California, that's not gonna happen. Now, childcare is different. Um, there hasn't been any mention in the mandate uh, regarding childcare, but like I said before, some families really re rely on after-school care, um, and that's not gonna exist if we're only doing um, the school from virtual or from remote. The American Academy of Pediatrics has in their, um, as a goal, that in-person schooling at the start of the school year is the goal, all right? And they say that in order to achieve that goal, certain principles have to be looked at. And I just outlined these principles here um, so that these uh, school districts would work with state and local authorities, that again, they have to be flexible and nimble. So when the time comes that the counts in a certain county or district become low, that they can mobilize and then reopen the schools. But at the same time, if a school district is open and you're doing in-person teaching, should the numbers arise, then they have the ability to again go back to remote learning, to kind of go back and forth. Um, I mentioned the uh, appropriateness of guidelines or policies being done in the school for safety to be appropriate for the child's age. Mask use is, is such an example. So when we think about younger kids, uh, kindergartners, pre-K and first graders, mask use may actually be uh, an issue because they are constantly touching the mask. 
And the minute you start touching the mask a lot, now you're introducing the potential for transmission of virus from the fingers to the mouth or to the nose. So the mask is really only good, right, if you're not touching the mask. Now, as you get older and more mature and understand the situation why, why you wear a mask, then that will be different. But that's an example of something that's practical and appropriate based on the age. One of the other principles is accommodations for the vulnerable. So, you know, again, Lisa talked about accommodations and um, the 504 plans that are, are in play. Those are still applicable. And the AAP was obviously um, wanting to make sure that that still stood. Um, no one is to be excluded and certain populations should not be marginalized. So we're talking like families who have English as a second language. We have to be careful that we don't ignore them and that we have to have these resources provided in multiple languages. Here's the last principle, and I, and I want to stress this. The policy should support the overall health and well-being, not only of the children and the adolescents, but the families as well and their communities. Okay, this is from the AAP. So they, they went away from their children-focused approach and realized that the families and the communities are also supported in this, in this guideline. And again, the reason why I bring it up, because so many people are focusing on the fact that these kids, while doing pretty well with COVID, should they get it or not get it at all, are not understanding that they can carry the virus and bring it home to more vulnerable individuals or even other people in the community. So in the AAP guidelines, they acknowledge that while the children may not have disease severity like that of the adults, there's still the potential for spread. All right, so you have to be vigilant of who is in the home, who the child may be exposed to, and who, even if they're not elderly, are there other vulnerable people in the house that may be vulnerable, other siblings that may be vulnerable, for example. And they acknowledge, AAP acknowledges, it is gonna be impossible to have zero risk. That, that it's not achievable. So it's all about minimizing the risk and how are you gonna minimize risk? And we're gonna talk about the guidelines again in a minute. So as I mentioned before on Friday, last Friday, Governor Newsom um, took the reins and gave some criteria as to what is gonna be considered um, the point by which schools will be closed in a given county. This is the map right now as of, last, of yesterday. I didn't put today's, this is yesterday. And I do have this web link on the bottom, which is really nice. It, it updates, um, daily and it gives you also not only which counties are closed as you can see those in orange are the ones closed right now so unless you're in the northern part of california uh, santa cruz county uh, san mateo county and then here in the central valley um, you're basically going to be at home doing remote learning and then you're going to have to re reach certain criteria in order to get off this watch list as he called it um, in order to do in-person teaching so if you are off the watch list for more uh, for two weeks or more that's going to what that's what's going to permit the schools to reopen but again if five percent of the school becomes positive with coronavirus or if 25 percent of the schools in a county have to close then you're going to have to go back to distance learning um, so there's other uh, things in the safety uh, mandate that he has sorry in the mandate that he made uh, regarding safety, and that includes uh, how positive cases will be dealt with. Um, and it should be noted that school districts can apply for waivers uh, using their local health officers. So I know a, a family that I saw just this week um, that is applying for a waiver for their charter school um, to see if they will open. I, I don't know what the status is going to be of it, but um, they're applying for a waiver. And so there are uh, options that you have even if your, your school district is closed. Masking in this mandate, um, they, again, he gave criteria. Third graders and older have to wear masks. And then the younger students are encouraged but not required. Uh, distancing is gonna be the six feet you've been hearing so much about. There will also be health screens being done actively and passively on school. Um, the testing of the school staff will be periodic. Um, so obviously it's also gonna be based on the burden in uh, the disease burden in a particular county of how often it will occur. And that the learning has to be rigorous and equivalent to that of in-person teaching. And he's actually devoted uh, quite a bit of money, $5.3 billion right now um, to public schools in order to try to help achieve this. Um, you gotta have to, you're gonna have to have all students have connectivity 
uh, to the internet that they'll have to have um, iPads or you know consoles that are going to be able to provide that distance learning. Um, so a lot has to be invested in order to get this rigorous distance learning um, to occur. So how are we going to achieve this? Um, the California Department of Education provided a checklist. This was June 2020, so this was prior to the mandate that came out last uh, Friday. But this is kind of the roadmap um, that's going to be used uh, once schools start to reopen. Um, the 10 principles are listed here that I put, and I'm just going to quickly go through them. Um, so the first thing that the California Department of Education mentioned is that local conditions have to permit the opening of the school. So as I mentioned before, you have to be off the watch list. And you're going to have to have to have testing availability for any kid who does have symptoms in the school. And so these are the things, as Lisa pointed out, that you're going to be asking your school what they're able to do. Um, there's also going to have to have a need for contact tracing. So once you identify someone who's positive, what is the team, what is the process by which they're going to find out who was in contact with that individual, and then how will they be tested and how will they be isolated? You're going to have to have equipment availability and an ongoing supply of it. Um, so again, uh, the number of masks uh, that, that Governor Newsom has uh, apply, uh, supplied for the schools are in the millions. Um, so the protective uh, equipment is going to be there. Certainly thermometers is also going to be part of the tool to do the screening in the school. These are non-touch thermometers, of course. And then you have to have cleaning supply avail availability, the, the disinfectants and um, the sprays that clean the, those frequently used surfaces. Now, once you have positive cases that do come up and they will come up, the schools have to have a plan. And that's, again, the empowerment that I'm hoping to give you in the, everybody, the families and the kids, so that they can ask the school, well, what is the plan that you have in mind? They should have it. Um, because again, this is from the California Department of Education, even before the schools reopen, there are going to be practice runs that they're going to be doing, and they're going to be tested, the faculty and the staff. So the idea to isolate at home for the child or for the school fac faculty, if the school faculty is positive, and isolation of those close contacts from the school. Um, what you're going to learn about in the distancing part is, and uh, Lisa mentioned it too, is the cohorts. So the idea is that if we can make the schools open when they do reopen, but have them, have them in cohorts, such that if the co one person in the cohort tests positive, then you just have to isolate that cohort from the rest of the school and not the entire school. So you minimize interactions between different cohorts. Um, and so I provided some other uh, bullets on the positive cases, temporary closures that may need to take place of certain areas where the child might have been. So they'll have to be closed so that you can disinfect the, the area, the floor, the chairs, et cetera, the classroom, et cetera. And then continuity of education should still continue for that individual who's positive through distance learning. Not only that, but meal programs should the child have been receiving them before should also be provided to that individual who tests positive. Campus access, you wanna minimize access, right? Again, it's all about minimizing traffic and minimizing number of exposures. Um, remember that the transmission of the virus is not just based on the person having the virus themselves, but also the time spent in the same area with that individual. So you wanna prevent as much cross traffic as you can. You're gonna limit the visitors and you're gonna have passive screening for those entering the campus. Um, parents are gonna be actively involved because we try, we try to rely on them as the kids wake up for school or get ready for school to look if they look sick, if they are coughing, if they feel warm. And, and the magic number you wanna uh, look at is 100.4 degrees Fahrenheit, which indicates a fever. So if the parents have made the determination that the child is um, not falling into a category allowing them to go to school, then they will stay at home. Um, and then active screening will take place on school campus. So. It, every school might be different about how they set it up. There was some mention in the, in the California Department of Education or in the Governor Newsom's mandate that they would actually have uh, questioners question each student as they come in. I don't know how um, 
logistically possible that may be because that would take away also from teaching time and and take a lot of time to go through each individual student to ask are you having fever are you having cough have you been exposed to anybody with COVID-19 um, we do that for, we do that for our hospitals but there may be other ways to do it for example now with our hospital we can answer these questions on on through our uh, through our cell phone and then we can just show our cell phone that we've answered the, the questions so maybe a similar thing can be done with the schools not that every kid has a cell phone um, but maybe some sort of device mechanism from the parents that can tell the school that they have been actively screened. Uh, then again, uh, a plan for symptomatic individuals should they occur while in school, but not only in school, but also on buses, um, that they have to have a plan um, should a kid have a fever on a bus or have coughing fits on a bus. So um, Betty White here is showing how you sneeze into your elbow properly while dabbing at the same time. Um, hand washing technique. Um, again, proper hand washing technique, 20 seconds, sing happy birthday two times, um, religiously wash your hands before and after pretty much every event that you're going to do, um, whether it's being on the playground, um, meals, um, using uh, instruments, uh, music instruments, typing, using a computer, etc. And again, avoiding touching the mask. So the mask wearing and the personal protective equipment I guess a lot of us have already been doing this in our community, so we kind of already know about it. Um, that said, there are individuals who don't have the ability to wear cloth masks. For instance, if they have some irritation to the cloth mask, um, a face shield is an alternative. So as you know, the face shields cover the eyes and then cover the entire nose and mouth and are usually a clear shield uh, that will go down below the chin. Um, there are also the idea that um, that some classes won't permit the mask. So uh, chemistry, for instance, where the mask may be a flammable you know, potential, so you're not gonna be able to wear it there. Uh, and there's also the problem that can occur with younger students. Uh, as you may know, the first and second and kindergartners who are learning to enunciate and learning their speech, oftentimes will learn also by looking at the lips of the teacher, by looking at how they enunciate, the teachers themselves enunciate words. So you may find that the teachers maybe using face shields instead of masks so that they can help um, the students learn. And this again is uh, for in-class uh, learning. Physical distancing, the six feet, we've learned that rule too. If we've been to the restaurants waiting in line for certain uh, uh, things out in public, whether it's at Target or Walmart. Cohorting classes I mentioned before. And also for at meal times, uh, using the outdoors as much as possible, eating outside as much as possible, really doing everything outside as much as possible is going to be the best. Again, there was a study done looking at the transmission of the virus indoor versus outdoor. And so there's a statistical difference uh, when you're outdoors um, as far as uh, getting the virus. Um, you want to, again, minimize traffic and cross traffic. The idea is that we're going to uh, have schools use, for example, one-way hallways. Um, so that you don't, just like they do it in grocery stores. I, I was at a Safeway just the other day, and you can see the arrows on the floor telling people to go in one-way traffic so you avoid cross traffic. Um, in this bus picture, you can see, too, the alternate um, seating arrangement that they have. And the idea, of course, being, too, that when the kids get on the bus, that they start, then everybody goes to the back first and then work their way forward um, so that you can try to minimize um, people coming uh, in touch with one another. Staggering the drop-offs and pickups in school, uh, limiting the number of adults that are entering the school, and then of course the distancing barriers that you can use like plexiglass in the office reception areas, the cafeterias, and even in, in between desks some people can uh, consider doing that as they're doing that in Southeast Asia right now. The cleaning and disinfecting, um, limiting the toys, stuffed animals those are harder to clean obviously but try to avoid also sharing of computers books and learning aids the idea is that you want to dis disinfect fr frequently used surface for sure like the doorknob that's um, shown here but one thought too is of course why not just leave the door open instead so you don't have to have individuals continu continuing to touch the doorknob um, and then another approach maybe and everybody will be different but once all the kids are in a the classroom then close the door so then the teacher can be just the one who touches that door. And then once class is over, then you can, you know, again, have the teacher open the door 
as I was saying before about cleaning the hands religiously, I would recommend entering a class, wash your hands, leaving the class, wash your hands um, with the sanitizer. So ventilation is super important um, in these schools. So they need to maximize central air filtration. And uh, though UV light has been shown to be hurtful to the coronavirus, it's not recommended in schools. And I think schools know this. So um, UV light, it can be uh, bad for the skin, especially in the kids. You don't want to have the risks outweigh the benefits, right? Um, and it's also important to note that the kids themselves should not take uh, partake in the disinfecting of the um, doorknobs or of the, of the desks themselves. Now, if they have their own wipes um, that you give them, that's different. But a lot of the cleaning disinfectants that, they'll, that the school will be provided, a lot of them may have chemicals that may cause reactions um, on the kid's skin uh, that you may not even be aware of that they may be allergic to. So you don't want to take that risk. Um, the communication that's going to take place is super important, obviously, because there's got to be a ready-made uh, uh, channel, whether it's through the cell phones or preferably cell phones or text messaging. Emails obviously can be missed, but this way you can create immediate notification plans for isolation of cases, for um, information of positive cases that can occur as reminders and guidelines to the families about washing hands or actively screening um, prior to them going to school. So the communication is obviously important and you're gonna to wanna to ask your schools about what notification uh, channels and plans that they have in place. Uh, and then some last thoughts from the AAP that I thought were important because we do have so many asthmatics in our population. Um, try to avoid nebulizers um, and use your personal meter dose inhalers and spacers as much as possible. Again, the nebulizers are gonna aerosolize a lot of um, solution into the air and the whole uh, area in that particular nursing station or, or in that particular room in the school, if that's where the nebulizer is used, is gonna be considered a contaminant. And that whole room would then have to be sterilized uh, and disinfected. Um, during this time more than ever, we need to have the availability of mental health professionals, um, depression, isolation, uh, the changes that have been occurring um, with COVID-19 uh, it is humbling to say the least and we need to have uh, these kids have the opportunity um, to vent or to talk it out um, with a professional who's able to hear them out. The plans are to be made by the school for those who have meal programs. As I mentioned before, there, there are some families, many families that re rely on the school um, as their source of food for a lot of their kids. Um, so these plans need to be made with the school and now it, I just keep saying now more than ever, but really this is important. And so I hope this is the last time I say now more than ever. Flu vaccines, um, very important this fall, very important. Why flu vaccines? Um, remember that having any virus again, having any flu virus, not coronavirus, but having any flu virus will make your immune system susceptible to other illnesses. And uh, by protecting ourselves against the flu, we can also protect ourselves against the coronavirus. And that's how I, I not, so not just for kids too, but for adults that they should get the flu vaccine as well. So, you know, knowing what you've heard and the benefits as we talked about before are listed here. And as Lisa mentioned, it doesn't become so much of a blanket statement about going to school or not going to school. It becomes an individualized decision that every family on this, on this channel right now or on this meeting today and for other families in our community are going to have to make for themselves because everybody is different and the risks we have to again understand are that a we do not know a lot about what COVID-19 will do in the short term and in the long term and with our T1D population like I said we don't have a lot of data on T1D we do have what we have now which appears to be that T1Ds do not appear to be at greater risk for contracting the virus, nor are they at an increased risk for complications should they get the virus, at least no more than usual with any other virus. There is the risk that they may have higher blood sugars than is typical, but right now we don't have the data to say that they're at increased risk for DKA, for instance. And here's the bigger one. If you have children who may be asymptomatic but are carrying the virus, are they gonna carry that virus to vulnerable people at home? 
and not just adults or grandparents, but even other siblings who may have other health issues. And then that other sibling may get the virus and may, may be asymptomatic and they may carry it to another individual. So this is what every family has to decide for themselves. And this is the conversation I'm having a lot with my families. And I'm sure we're going to have a discussion and a lot of questions after this talk, perhaps, on, on this point. Um, but I just want to emphasize that. So here's my sum up slide. And I hope to finish um, um, by, by the end of the half hour. I think I am. Uh, mask. Mask as long as you're not exempted. And, and you may even want to consider eyewear. I know, and in, in again, some of the Southeast East Asian countries like China and Korea, this, this is also being used, the face shield. Beware of mask with valves. If for those who don't already know, you might see these kind of high-tech masks that are being worn by individuals on the, in the community. Those valves protect the wearer, but they do, they do not protect those around them. So they filter air going in. They do not filter the air breathed out by that individual. So that individual, I'm not gonna make judgments, but they're protecting themselves, but they're not protecting the others around them. So be careful about that. Wash religiously. Um, remind your kids about how to hand wash correctly. You, I would provide personal hand sanitizers, you know, the, the travel ones or the ones you can attach to your keys or your backpack. So it's always on them, the sanitizer. Um, wash the hands before going everywhere in the school. Um, but certainly when you leave for the school and coming home from the school, wash hands, right, to prevent a transmission as much as possible. Remember the distance rule of six feet. Beware of time of exposures as well, as I mentioned before. And as I mentioned, the theme of tonight, empowerment. Be active on your parents' school district meetings. You, you've now been given some of the guidelines, and my last slide of this talk are the resources and the websites you can go to. Um, to look at the 50 page documents and they're literally 50 pages each of them um, to kind of go over um, the things that I summarized in this particular talk and at the end of the day you're going to weigh the personal benefit of attending school with the risk of potential exposure to those who may be vulnerable at home so in this last quote um, I was taken by this individual who has T1D for 30 years and I got it from her diatribe dialogue so she had contracted COVID-19 and she discussed her um, glycemic control and what she had to deal with. But the quote is really telling, the coronavirus has shown the entire world that there are things that humans can't control, but that does not mean we have no control. And I'm hoping through this talk that I've kind of given you some tools and some guidelines that not only can you ask your school of, but you can look to your family and yourselves, what you can do. As Lisa said, we're doing this together and I think as we do it together, we can beat this virus. It really does take everybody to be on the same wavelength. And when we're not on the same wavelength, then we get this kind of uh, secondary spikes in the coronavirus, et cetera. But we really have to work together. These are the, um, the sources that I was using in this presentation from the CDC, the AAP, American Academy of Pediatrics, the California Department of Education, and Governor Newsom's mandate, as I mentioned. These are the websites. Um, should you want to take a closer look at the guidelines because I tried my best to summarize each of these 50 page documents um, But if you want to look at yourself I, I, I want you to know that they are publicly available and you should absolutely look into it and That's that um, So thank you for your attention. Um, hopefully everybody enjoyed their dinner uh, And I didn't I didn't make it too boring of a dinner time show <laughs> And hopefully I wasn't on mute this whole time and no one told me. <laughs> we heard you, Tarek. Okay. Oh, yeah, okay. thank you so much for sharing that. Um, I just realized I'm in the dark too, so I should turn the light on. <laughs> we have a couple recurring questions through the chat. Do you mind, do you have a couple minutes? I know we're kind of over. Oh yeah, absolutely. I'm okay. here as long as you need me. Uh -huh. Okay, so if other people have questions, now would be the right time to put them into the chat box and we'll cover what we can. So one of the questions is about um, the article about the new T1D diagnoses as a result of COVID-19. So the question is, is, um, is there an explanation for that and is this being tracked? Sorry, the article on which one? I oh. don't know exactly oh, where yeah. it's from. It, yeah, that was actually from uh, Dr. Mary Pat Gallagher's. Uh, she was one of the authors on that particular study. And, and what was the question about it? 
about um, what the explanation is behind the new T1D diagnoses around co around time of COVID, and if that is being tracked in those, like in terms of a bigger study. Oh, okay, okay, okay. So that that's a study I did not present. Um, so I haven't presented that study. Um, the study that has come out, I believe he's talking, or whoever is asking, it might be the one coming from Europe. Um, we are going to, we're ongoing collecting that data to see what type of uh, numbers we're getting with the new onsets. There is in vitro studies that have shown that coronavirus does infiltrate into the beta cells. And that may be one of the reasons why type twos are particularly vulnerable. Because as you know, with type two, who may not be on insulin, um, and they're managing with uh, 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 pills or medications that are helping their insulin release, now you have a virus that gets, it, gets into the beta cells and impairs their ability to make insulin, and they can even get into DKA. Now, if you already have type one diabetes, you're already on insulin. So who cares if the coronavirus is you know, invading your beta cells, and the beta cells may already be destroyed at that point. But with new onsets, right, who theoretically had beta cells that were churning out um, insulin, there, there is a theoretical possibility that the coronavirus just accelerated the process. So I think time is going to tell. I think there may be, um, again, numbers that sh seem to show that there is going to be an increase. But my guess is, is that they were already on their way to develop type 1 diabetes, and this accelerated the process. Great. Thank you. Um, let's see. Uh, um, we have a lot of questions about just your professional opinion on if kids should return to on-site school, but I do think you covered that by saying that this is a very individualized process, but yeah. I also know people are really looking for something from you about that, but you can choose whether you want to address that or not. <laughs> well, I, I wrote the, the risk versus benefits, and I am very... Uh, I want to emphasize the risks. I, I don't think anybody should be judged, I think Lisa mentioned this already, about what decision they ultimately make. Um, and I think after everybody, and they can maybe email me or contact me on the side and let me know their individual situation so that I can make a, a little bit more of a, uh, a better idea on recommendations um, on a personal level. Um, because I, I, you know, to, to kind of segue to another, to another point, a lot of people are asking me about college, you know, we, we didn't really talk about college, but that's a big question. Should my kid go back to college this fall? Um, and even if they're not doing in-person teaching and they're just doing remote learning, should I send my kid back to the dorm or should I send them back to, you know, their, their sorority or their fraternity, et cetera? Well, all the guidelines still apply. I mean, if you have an individual and I'm not going to judge anybody's, you know, college daughter or son, but if you have an individual who's actually prepared to wear the mask and socially distant and, you know, um, avoid the parties and the bars and the intermixing, then perhaps they are able to go back to school. Um, perhaps they are able to still go to the campus. Now, if you have any doubt that that child may not be, or that not child, but young adult is able to follow those guidelines, then they become a risk. And now they're going to come home during Thanksgiving or during the winter and potentially then bring a virus to grandma, grandpa, et cetera. Um, you know, it's, it, again, it's very individual. All the same guidelines, though, still apply, whether it's college or kindergarten. I'd like to throw a uh, lifeline out to you, Tariq, just to say this, which is, and, and Tariq and I uh, were talking about this before this evening started. Um, my son is also a physician and uh, all of us who are parents are desperate for answers. And I think we need to remember, as Tariq has pointed out all night, we know some things, we know more than what we knew in March, but there's still a lot we don't know. And that it is unfolding every day, multiple times a day. And we have to assume some responsibility ourselves as parents to make these decisions and, and not deflect them 
to our healthcare providers because they are giving us the best information they have and it is frustrating to not have more. We will have more. We had just have to make some hard decisions, I think. Yeah, you know, a great example of the whole way things shift. And I mean, Dr. Uh, Dr. Trump, um, President Trump has already men made mention himself that Dr. Fauci in the beginning had a different stance on mask use, right? In the very beginning. Obviously, that has uh, changed as time has gone on, obviously. Just last week, as I mentioned before, the big study that was from South Korea on the transmission of virus from children ages 10 to 20, again, will shift the entire approach that has not yet been reflected in our community because it just came out this study. Um, again, how we will think about kids and their potential as a carrier to, to transmit it to someone in the house. So it's very fluid um, and week to week, I have to myself stay in, in touch with what's going on. And so I apologize and thank you, Lisa, for making the points that are to be made is that it's an all individual, but it's also very fluid and things change very fast. If anything, this is how I'd approach it. I would be conservative. And as I mentioned before, I would be cautious. And that we cannot, just because we haven't been seeing acute uh, findings in kids, or even long-term side effects from kids because there just hasn't been any long-term data come out yet. We can't assume that our kids are completely safe from the virus. And I know that again, there's a lot of mixed messaging and I wanna, I, I gotta throw that out there. I think it's my responsibility as a pediatrician, that's my Gen Peds hat that I have to wear because um, I, and I do get it that there is a lot to be gained from inpatient or inpatient, in-person learning. Um, but again, I think again, the in-person learning and the ages is also going to be very different of what you get from in-person learning. Thank you. I think that's a great place to stop. Um, we did go way over time, so I want to thank you. Sorry. Well, I mean, <laughs> no, it was great. We got a lot covered and we had a lot of content to go over tonight. So thank you both so much, um, Tarek and Lisa, for all of your knowledge and for sharing with us. And I want to just remind everybody again, I am going to be sending an email with all of these, um, Doc, supporting documents and the recording and we're also going to put the recording on our website for the next few weeks as um, this topic is really relevant so if you have folks who you know who were, weren't able to make it tonight um, we'll have that posted on our website tomorrow morning I'm also going to include we did a, um, a recorded session a maybe about a month ago with Steve Gittleman and um, Maureen McGrath on just general sick day management and reminders about what should be in your sick day kit and things like that. Um, so I'm going to send the recording out in the email as well in case you need a refresher on um, what to make sure you have prepared in case your child has um, COVID or other, other sicknesses in general. And as a final reminder, um, we are able to provide these programs for free this summer from our supportive community. And so if tonight was beneficial for you or you found some value in the content, um, please, please, please make a donation on our website, dyf.org. We are a nonprofit. All donations are tax deductible. And we really appreciate your support so that we're able to continue doing programs like these um, free of charge for everybody. So with that, I'm going to close the meeting. Thank you all so, so much. We hope to see you at other programs soon. The full list is on our website. You can check it out. Thanks, everybody. Thank you. All right, thanks, Kaylor. Thanks, everybody. Thank you. Thank you. Thanks, Lisa. Thank you, everyone.